So my name is Tom Heritage. I'm based in BBC's R&D department in London, and I'm joined here today uh, by uh, Kevin Burrows. So we've both been working on AS11 specifications uh, for a number of years, um, most recently on extending the AS11 family uh, to cover additional business requirements. I've been working on the means of building these new specifications from building blocks here in BBC R&D with colleagues. Um, and I'll un hand over to Kevin to uh, explain his involvement. Thank you, Tom. Um, so currently I'm an independent media consultant. I've been managing the international versions of the um, AS11 specification on behalf of the ANWA. Um, and that's really been working with the Nordic, Australian and New Zealand broadcasters. Hand back to Tom. Okay, fantastic, Kevin. Thank you very much. I've included the website of AS11 on the MR webpage at the bottom here, and there'll be some more links at the end of the presentation. Also, I'll send out the presentation after the event so that you have the slides and the, the various links, etc. However, you can get to all the information and much of what's presented here on the AMWAL website by going to the link at the bottom of the page. So today we wanted to talk about the expansion to the AS11 family and begin by talking about the changes to how we publish the AS11 specifications within the AMWA. So we talk about building specifications from blocks or rules, this is rules-based specifications, how we now publish the specifications like software using the popular open source software hosting site GitHub, and how we publish using an RFC style process, so like standards in the internet community. We'll look a little at a technical overview of the family of AS11 specifications, and then what we're going to do next in order to help the industry adopt and implement these new specifications. And we conclude with opportunity for some uh, Q&A. Although if things do come up during the event which require clarification, please do make use of the Q&A uh, text box on your screen or send a chat message. We'll have some more links to say at the end of the presentation further resources. So when we're talking about AS11 now, what we're talking about is very much a family of specifications. What they have in common is they define a constrained set of media file formats for the delivery of finished media assets to a broadcaster or publisher. So for example, a finished television program for delivery to a broadcaster in a particular domain. And the point is each specification is developed with particular business purpose, business requirements in mind. So three areas around the changes of publication we want to cover, as I highlighted before, the rules-based approach, the publishing on GitHub, and taking an RFC style to the publication process within AMWAR more generally. So applying that to AS11 as well as other AMWAR publications. So to begin with, talk about the rules-based approach to building this family of AS11 specifications. In the rules-based approach, we build specifications from common building blocks. So there's a recognition that all the specifications are different, uh, but they all have very many characteristics or pieces in common. By breaking them down into these building blocks, these components, we can construct different combinations of building blocks to form the different specifications. At the same time, we aim to express the specifications in a more machine-friendly machine and developer-friendly way uh, that's concise and ambiguous and which has testability of the files that comply to that specification at the heart of it. So ultimately, if we can improve intelligibility of the specifications, interoperability, and maximize code reuse, then this should help the industry with 
adopting and successfully implementing the new specifications. We began this approach um, a couple of years ago with the first two A7 specifications, which we use for SD and HD in the UK, and that enabled us to run a compliance program in the DPP, it's a digital production partnership here in the UK, which is a collaboration between the main UK broadcasters. And as a result of that, we're able to have devices from manufacturers certified by the AMWA for their support for the AS11 DPP HD specification. So in the rules-based building block-based approach, each specification is composed of blocks, these building blocks that are pieced together. Inside the building blocks, they're made up of a number of artifacts, which are actual pieces of data or uh, sentences that specify a, a concise, a specific constraint, uh, for example, that a file must conform to um, SMPTE's ST377-1, which is the main MXF standard. In addition, there are other components, uh, such as notes, which give informative guidance, references and terms, so that we can refer to other documents, such as SMPTE standards. So here we have an example of how the specification constructed using the rules-based approach can be presented. And here we're seeing a small piece of it. We're seeing one of these building blocks, which governs the fact that the MXF file must actually be an MXF file in conformance with the SMPTE standard. So some important features are, we can see here, the statement of conformance to the SMPTE document, which is a, a particular reference document that's marked up in the system. The block has an ID, which is a URL, so it can be unambiguously identified. And we have a note uh, giving some useful uh, guidance. So many of the aspects you'd see in, in any specification or standard, but explicitly broken down and, and labeled. So the link here takes us to the latest development version of the S11 X1 specification, one of the new specifications in the S11 family, and that one is for the DPP UHD program delivery. So if we open that page up and zoom in a little, we can see a lot of introductory text that explains what the specification is about, how to read the document, etc. And then we get down to the core of the specification, which is this tree of building blocks that have been stuck together to form the meat of the specification. So we open up this block, and it's composed of a number of other smaller building blocks. And inside we see the one we were just looking at the snippet of that says we have to conform to SMPTE's ST377-1 with its note attached. And we can hover over terms to see more information or click on them to uh, get further details, the link to where we can find the SMPTE document, etc. So it's a small taste of, of what one of these specifications can look like. I should say this web page is live on the internet and has been for a number of months, so you can go directly there and look at it for yourselves by following the links from the AMWAR AS11 website. So another aspect to the changes in publication is treating specifications more like software and publishing as a repository on GitHub, which is a very popular software hosting service or website. It's particularly used in the open source community. So we put all the files that make up the specification onto GitHub. That makes them easily accessible to people, particularly our software developer audience in the manufacturer's 
we would be implementing the specifications. It provides us all the usual tools that any GitHub repository would have, for example, uh, being able to see a full change history, a look at tagged versions of the specification, so different releases at different points in time as the specification has matured, and uh, issue tracker to keep track of known problems that people have found and issues that need to be addressed. And within the repository, a number of different aspects that might be different, might be useful to different audiences. So if we open up the GitHub page, we can see some of that. This is the URL for the GitHub site for S7X1 specification, which we were just looking at. Let's so zoom in a little. So when you first get here, as is common with any project on GitHub, you get a, a readme telling you how to get started, what the contents of the repository are, etc. So how to use this and find your way around. And then inside here, we have a number of different components. One is the web page we were just looking at. And we also have alternative views of the block space structure of the specification, for example, as a text file, which might be uh, more convenient, for example, if you want to look at the differences between, between two specifications, you can no use a normal text differencing or diffing tool. And a number of other files that make up the specification, for example, XML schemas or XML representation of um, metadata items that are used in the file, in the MXF file. That's about where we publish. And the last asset was adopting an RFC style approach to publication in the AMWA, including for AS11 specifications as well as others. And the idea here is that specifications are made available as early as possible for the community to review. At all stages during this process, the specifications are public. But at the beginning, we explicitly note that they are work in progress, so they're ready for review, but we're still at the feedback and prototyping stage. That's the current position of all the AS11 family specifications that we've added recently. So the two legacy SD and HD specifications obviously have been well implemented, particularly in the UK, but all those we've added recently are currently at the work in progress stage. We very soon be elevating at least one of them to the next stage, which is a proposed specification, which is where we're saying this has been around long enough and been reviewed enough to be deemed ready for production implementation. And the final level of full specification is reached once a specification has been thoroughly uh, used and implemented in real workflows, in real broadcasters or publishers or wherever it applies. So it's a statement that a specification is truly useful to the industry and has been demonstrated as such. So that level can only be reached once specifications are in a number of products and in use in real workflows. So that covers some of the changes in approach to publication. Next, we'll provide a, a brief technical overview of the new specifications. All these details are available on the AMWO website, so I won't try to go into all the details here, but um, I'll pull out some of the highlights. So in this table, we're trying to compare the properties of the two original AS11 specifications, that's DPPSD and DPPHD, with new X1 specification, which is also for the DPP, but this time for UHD programs. So some aspects are similar, such as um, the way we signal the segmentation of parts within the program and some of the underlying MXF structure. Um, but the 
essence encoding details and of course the video format details are different now supporting 2160p 25 and 50 frames per second also importantly we moved to having multi-channel soundtracks or audio tracks and these tracks are labeled with the details of how they're to be played back and what content they contain we'll talk a little more about what that means later also the metadata that is embedded is embedded as an xml document now and again we'll see a little bit later what that means so here we're comparing the two original DPPSD and HD specifications with X1 and also additional ones that Kevin is going to brief us on. Thank you, Tom. So I'll give a short background to the evolution of these international versions. These are known as X2, 3, 4 and 7. Um, firstly, for the X2 version, um, this was driven by Australia and New Zealand who had very similar requirements in the, uh, to the UK for program delivery. Uh, I very similar to the HD version for um, original DPP. Um, they wanted to implement the existing AVCI profile, um, but within the new AMWA specification framework that Tom's just outlined, being rules based. Um, uh, the main changes really being to the DPP spec. Are firstly, the um, the optional addition of the simply multi-channel and audio track labelling. That's instead of the EBU track templates. Uh, we'll Tom will cover a bit more on that in a moment. Uh, the support for all of the current audio loudness standards, which have been um, identified and the, the ones currently implemented in different territories. Um, and also, as Tom mentioned previously, the inclusion of the descriptive metadata as XML rather than the embedded KLV in the MXF file. Uh, again, we'll explain more on this shortly. In terms of the X3 and X4 versions, they're based on requirements from the Nordics and they wanted a 1080p profile using the AVC Longop codec based at 50 megabits a second. Um, in essence, the only difference between X3 and X4 are the frame rates, X3 being 25.50 and X4 being 23.98, for uh, effectively European and non-European uh, use. Um, and finally, just on AS11 X7, again, this was initially to be adopted by, or will be initially adopted by Australia and New Zealand. It's uh, an SD version uh, based on the D10 codec, which is the original DVP um, codec version. Um, basically using the same framework as the other AS11 versions, but to enable common production broadcaster workflows within a um, both uh, a new commissioned SD where it's still uh, applicable and a legacy SD program environment. Um, a key requirement of all of these um, X specification families where possible was to include common metadata set across all of them to, to minimize interoperability issues and, and maximize sort of uh, development take up um, across all the vendors. Um, so I'll now hand back over to Tom, who's going to cover the, the new X8 and X9 NARBA versions. Thank you, Kevin. So on this next table, we're showing again the UK DPP SD and HD. But this time, we've added AS11 and X8 and X9. So these are two new AS11 family members we've added very recently. At NAB in Las Vegas recently, uh, the North American Broadcast Association, NABA, announced two delivery specifications for TV programs in North America, uh, an HD delivery specification that uses MPEG-2 and an HD delivery specification that uses AVC. Those both are based on AMW AS11 specifications, X8 and X9, and those delivery documents were developed in collaboration with the UK DPP. So essentially, X8 is so essentially X8 is 
Simpty RDD9, which is basically XD cam, uh, with the additions of the uh, multi channel audio labeling and the embedded XML metadata, as well as closed captions. So essentially, it's taking existing file format and adding some extras onto it. And X9 is very similar to many of the other new X specifications, but just adds closed captions for American users and adds the video signal standards appropriate for them, 720p, 5994, and 1080i, 2997. So one alternative way of looking at all this is in a more blocks-based way, looking at the building blocks that make up these specifications, because that is how they are being built. So here we have some simplified diagrams of the building block construction of the specifications. So at the top left, we've got UK DPP, SD, and HD specifications. And then if we start at the top right, we've got AS11X7, which is an SD specification for international broadcasters. If you compare that to the DPPSD one, you see there are quite a few blocks in common, which are in blue. So everything in blue you'll see is in the two original DPP specifications. So X7 has a number of areas in blue that are from the DPPSD and has a number of new things added to so the XML embedded metadata. Another piece of information that counts as metadata called specification ID, and also some other um, minor constraints on the content. So it's very similar to the DPSD, except that the way the embedded metadata, descriptive metadata, is technically carried out is different it's XML embedded metadata rather than a traditional KLV. Moving down to the bottom of the slide, the very multicolored box that says common file architecture is underlying five of the specifications, X1, 2, 3, 4, and 9. And you'll see it has some blue bits in common with the original DPP specifications also a number of new areas, particularly around the multi-channel audio, multi-channel audio labeling, and the XML embedded metadata. You'll see a couple of dotted lines, one on the video constraints and one on the multi-channel audio details. So that allows different details to be plugged in by the different specifications. So X1, 2, 3, 4, and 9 all have that same common file architecture. Um, but they have different video constraints because some of them are HD and some of them, are, uh, one of them is UHD. Also, they have different AVC or H.264 encoding constraints or requirements, as well as different allowed audio layouts. At the bottom, we have the Narva's HD MPEG-2 specification, which is S and X8. And as I was explaining, that's essentially um, an XD cam file with the additions of the XML metadata, multi-channel audio labeling. So again, you'll see some blue box that come from the original spec and also a number of blocks that are shared with the other new specs. So taking this kind of block-based approach is useful to showing which pieces are in common and which are different. and that helps to see how easy or otherwise it would be to support each of the specifications in a product, for example, because if you already support the existing DPPSD and HD, you probably have some code that uh, can be reused for the, the blue parts. And if you then implement um, the X1, for example, if you already support XD cam, then you can probably support X8 as well. And you can then quickly see how different modules can be reused to support different specifications. So we said one of the 
new features is the multi-channel audio labeling. So I'll show an example here where we have multi-channel soundtracks or audio tracks with the labeling applied, just to give you a flavor of what that uh, involves. So you'll see in this example, we've got four soundtracks. Um, we've got a stereo one, a 5.1, then stereo, then another stereo. So each soundtrack in this case contains all of the audio channels for that sound field, as the terminology goes in the MXF framework we're using. What we then do is we add in these blue boxes, which are the labels identifying the audio channels you have, the details of the sound field, so that's the physical configuration information. So is it stereo? Is it 5.1? Which channel do you play out on which speaker? As well as the language. And then finally, on the left, the group of sound field groups in the terminology of this labeling framework, which basically tells you what's the content or purpose of this audio. So main program or music and effects, etc. So this framework, comes from SMPT document, which explains how to do multi-channel audio labeling in MXF and is the same framework as used by IMF, which is the international mastering format as adopted by um, maybe even the cinema world and increasing interest from others, for example, in broadcasting. So give a small flavor of that, of course, more details available them on our website. The other aspect was about embedding descriptive metadata as an XML document. So just to show a little more what that means, in the MXF file, there is always a large amount of technical metadata. For example, which version of MXF do you conform to? What are the details of the audio, the sample rate, what's the picture size, how's it encoded, etc. We're adding some extra details to that, such as the IDs of the specifications you're conforming to, so that you can easily see which AS11 specifications does this MXF file conform to. And also the multi-channel audio labeling we we're just talking about. That's all really technical information that you need to be able to play the file properly. And then in addition to that, we're adding all of the descriptive or editorial metadata that's not essential for playing back the file as an embedded XML document. So things like what's the program ID or material number or clock number, whatever you call it, details such as the program title, has the program got burnt in signing, has the program been tested uh, for any um, quality issues, um, etc. So all of that information which uh, gives an insight into the workflow and content of the file is captured in one XML document and that's embedded in the MXF file. This keeps it separate to everything else. It makes it much easier to change the XML schema to record different metadata later. And it's much easier to implement because in terms of the tooling that write the MXF files or read the MXF files, you only need to be able to embed or extract an XML document. And you can leave the understanding of what all the fields inside the XML mean to a higher level in the software or hand that over completely to the user. So that should have us to vary what metadata is embedded more easily. So now we've covered the changes in publication and a brief technical overview. Now just highlight some of the steps we'll be taking next to implement the new specifications and help uh, manufacturers in particular understand what's needed to implement interoperable specifications. So I should point out that 
there's another project on GitHub which gives an overview of AS11 where we've got details of sample files and MXF tools that support the new specifications as well as the issue tracker for known problems with the specifications. Again, the link for this is on the AS11 ANWR webpage. So beginning at X1, which is the DPP's UHD program specification, we've now got first round of sample files available. There's a link there which you'll be able to click in the PDF I sent round or go to the AMOR website. There'll be a um, opportunity for feedback on the specification by email to the DPP, Digital Production Partnership. There'll be a a forum for DPP members who are manufacturers and suppliers next month. And on the 12th of July, on the day before the Hollywood Post Alliance UK Tech Retreat, we'll be having a Plugfest day. The Plugfest and the sample files are open to everybody in the industry. There's no need to be a DPP member. So please do get in touch if you're interested in uh, attending the Plugfest. Now I'll hand over to Kevin to talk about X234 and 7. Thank you, Tom. Um, so yes, the next steps really for the uh, X2 international version. Um, so uh, Australia and New Zealand are starting to engage with their key suppliers now on implementing this specification. Uh, that's both the vendors, system suppliers, and uh, you know production companies. Uh, they'd like to use this and introduce it as soon as possible, uh, and are currently updating their workflows and systems at their facilities. Um, we've also, for information, set up an AS11 family forum on Basecamp. Um, this will be available for any of the AS11 specifications, and it'll uh, really enable anyone to post any queries, comments on the specifications, and we'd encourage anyone to, to utilize that in terms of coming back with anything, um, any queries or any updates or comments that you may have. Um, there are now sample files available for use uh, for X2 by equipment vendors and broadcasters. Um, we'll put up the, at the following link there. So we'll put that up at the end also. Um, X2 is now very close to moving from work in progress to a proposed specification. It's been, um, there's been a lot of discussion around the detail in line with some of the other, uh, or all of the other X versions. Um, we're now in a, a point of just clarifying a few minor details and then hopefully in the next week or so we'll be in a position to make that a proposed specification. Uh, and uh, as I say, Australia, New Zealand in particular, are very keen to utilize that as soon as possible. Um, they're also in the process of updating their supplementary broadcaster guidelines, um, which are now virtually complete. Um, and also planning interoperability testing between their production companies and broadcasters as soon as that's practical to kind of flush out any interoperability issues they may find. Um, so that's where we are with X2. If we can move on to X3. So X3 and X4, as I said before, the only difference being the frame rate. So they will be um, published at the same time. Um, there's still uh, a, some minor details we worked out through the long GOP, uh, the AVC long GOP specification. So that's uh, that'll follow very shortly. Uh, we hope very uh, very soon, though. So that's that's the only difference really being. Um, finalizing those details. Um, again, manufacturer and supplier engagement is starting and that'll be uh, that'll be more complete once the um, AVC long got details are finished. Uh, again, interoperability testing, particularly around the AVC long got implementation is planned in the next month or so, hopefully. Um, and again, the necessary or associated broadcast delivery guidelines um, is well underway and uh, again due to be published and released to their suppliers very soon. Okay, and finally for the X7 version, um, again in line with the Australian 
and New Zealand demands for X2. This will be uh, planned for as soon as possible. Uh, they've got a lot of legacy material that will utilise this as well as some still new SD commissions which is still in progress uh, under various contracts. Um, and as with X2, manufacturer and supplier engagement is starting. Uh, sample files um, to this, as we mentioned earlier, will, will hopefully be created very soon. That's for the for the X7 version. Um, and uh, as mentioned previously, the this will be included within the broadcaster guidelines um, and and utilised again with the interoperability testing that they'll be doing with the production companies. So that's kind of where we are on, on that one. So I'll, if you've got um, X8 and X9 next steps, or shall I move on to the next slide? Sorry, yeah, I don't have any slide here on X8 or X9. Okay. Um, but I will provide a brief update on that. Um, so. Currently, the process is we're making some sample files for X8 and X9 for internal testing with those broadcasters involved, and also getting the initial uh, draft available of the uh, two specifications, which will then be available on GitHub um, as work in progress. So those should be available soon, and the results of the testing with the broadcasters available. The other relevant point is that the DPP announced recently that their compliance program activity would cover all the AS11 HD specifications and UHD. So that would uh, include X1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, and 9. Sorry, not 7, 8 and 9 as well. And DP would include uh, testing of those in its uh, activities with manufacturers in its uh, compliance program, which it uh, provides to its members. So that concludes the uh, discussion on the next steps towards implementation. There are a number of links and information here um, at the end of the uh, deck of slides. The main link is for the AMWAR website, the AS11 page. Kevin mentioned the AS11 family group on Basecamp um, for discussion, etc. We don't have another webinar planned, but uh, we'll be able to hold another one if there are groups of people interested. Uh, but the recording of the last one is already available on YouTube uh, if people want to uh, follow up on that there. As we mentioned several times, there are sample files and other implementation resources available. And uh, PlugFest coming up for the DPP's UHD AS7X1 specification in July. And our email address is there so you can get in contact with us directly. <laughs>